Thanks for joining uh, the second week of Mass Timber March Madness. Um, I'm happy to have Daniel Hall here. I've known him for years. He's ideally qualified to speak on industrialized construction since he started the Industrialized Construction Forum. And how do we connect the US and Europe? He's at ETH Zurich in Stanford. I'm sure he'll give you a lot of background, but let's jump in. We'll take uh, questions at the end of Daniel's presentation. And hopefully I know we'll have a lively discussion. Thank you, Daniel, could you begin? Is the screen there? Yeah, the screen, I'm looking at your screen. It is working. Mass timber industrialized construction. I just forgot to unmute before I went full screen. So <laughs> I'm, okay. I'm back. All right. Um, all right. Thanks very much, Greg, for having me. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, so um, uh, I've known Greg for a while and he asked me to speak about the connection between mass timber and industrialized construction. And while I would not consider myself a mass timber expert, um, I'm happy to be here. And um, I am happy to think about or was thinking a lot about the connections between mass timber and industrialized construction, which I hope we can cover today. So as I understand, I will give, I'm, I'm planning on giving about a 30 minute presentation here and uh, then I would love to have a lot of Q&A and discussion. So um, I'll go through the whole presentation and then we can leave, uh, leave a lot of it for discussion. Um, a little bit about myself. So I'm for a little over three years now, I've been assistant professor of innovative and industrial construction at uh, ETH or ETH Zurich. Um, so I relocated from the West Coast of the United States to Switzerland. Um, I, before that I did my, my master's and my PhD at Stanford University. Um, I will point out, I also have three years of industry experience, although not in an industrialized capacity, but as a project engineer uh, working on uh, real construction projects on, in California. And, uh, you know, probably the reason why I'm here today is because back in 2014, I founded something called the Industrialized Construction Forum. And uh, this was a picture from our very first Industrialized Construction Forum. There's about uh, maybe 15 or 20 people. Bonus points if anybody here was in the room that day, but um, we got together at Stanford to talk about this thing about industrialization of construction. It wasn't really on the radar, but um, in my capacity, we, we, I saw there was a lot of companies that were starting to found or, or come around this idea of prefabrication, offsite industrialization. And I just wanted to start an event where we could talk to each other. I had no idea that you know, by 2018, we would grow to fill a full room and we would have 200 people attending. And then in our, our most recent one, which just finished, um, we had a, a, a huge capacity, a huge online presence um, where we, we put together a really great uh, program of speakers uh, talking about the future of, of industrialized construction. And I use industrialized construction uh, holistically and uh, comprehensive of uh, many topics such as robotics uh, uh, and other types of fabrication, timber, concrete, steel. I'm very agnostic to the specific approach, but overall we're talking about efforts to industrialize the construction industry and that's what unites us. I'll say more about what exactly industrialized construction is in my mind and how it connects to um, the broader conversation. So um, to carry on uh, then, after founding this forum, which we still run every year, I moved to Switzerland. And um, this is a picture where I was really introduced to uh, the robotics and construction. Most of my experience came from prefabricated, kind of more um, panelized or volumetric modular systems. Um, but then I was introduced to uh, the really incredible world leading research ha happening um, with ETH in the, there's a National Center for Competence in Research. Um, and this is part of uh, that, that center where um, we have a robotics lab called the Robotic Fabrication Laboratory. Um, and here's, you know, just example of one of the, the projects where you have, uh, you know, two arms and a human working together to create spatial timber assemblies. And uh, so this really opened up a whole new line of, of thinking for me about industrialization through robotics as well. But I bring this up because we have a lot of industry that's visited me. Uh, uh, Greg visited me a couple of years ago, pre-COVID and many other industry visitors and, and, and in general industry comes. And when industry visits um, 
the NCCR or, or the DFAB house project, which is one of the biggest projects that came out of it, and the Robotic Fabrication Lab, I usually hear two things. I, I hear two things uh, uh, over and over again. Um, the first thing is like, wow, like this is really like amazing state of the art stuff. And these are from leading kind of innovation directors of construction companies or architecture firms across the world. And I'd say, well, yeah, I agree. It's really great. And so I like to ask the question, what would it take for you to implement some of these technologies in your, in your company? Uh, and the response I hear a lot is, oh, we could never do that. Uh, we could never implement something like that. That's way beyond uh, kind of our capacity. And I find that really interesting and also a bit um, um, maybe frightening to think that some of our leading companies in industry can't even imagine implementing some of our some of the the research innovations. So there's a big gap there, and part of my mission my my mission is to try to try to find a way to bridge that gap. Um, but part of it also comes from this quote, which I found that I think really captures the problem that. The, the, the gap between what could be possible with innovation and construction and what we actually implement on our projects in the architecture, engineering and construction world. Um, I thought it really captures the gap. It says, I'll read it to you. In the construction industry, many firms have shielded themselves from technological competition. They have enjoyed a false sense of security. The industry suffers from declining productivity, falling, profitability and worsening competitive position. Cost minimization rather than new product development is the dominant business strategy. And I thought to myself, that's a very you know, great critique and assessment of, of my view as a construction management professor, um, that most of the, the orientation is around cost minimization. How do we take a design and make it as you know, low cost as possible? And I think that that mentality goes throughout everywhere. And so, you know, that's a, I thought that was a great quote. I thought, man, they really have their finger on the pulse of the industry today. Um, that quote is from 1989. So in 30 years, we haven't seen much change, I would argue. Um, so, uh, you know, what I wanna talk about today, especially as I thought about mass timber is this first idea uh, or is the second idea. So cost minimization is one thing, but could we think about today the opportunities for new product development. And when we're talking about new product development, what we're really talking about is creating value um, and creating more value. And that value should be at a, a competitive cost position, but we should also think about um, not just taking our existing systems and making them faster, cheaper, better, but reframing the value proposition, maybe reframing some of the product architecture overall so that we can um, create more value. And you know, the working thesis that I came up with for today's talk is that industrialized construction offers the best opportunity that I know of for new product development in AEC. And I would say this compared to, uh, this would apply for mass timber, it would apply for 3D printing, it would apply in all different areas. Um, my argument would be that if we're gonna talk about product development, industrialized construction approach is the best approach. But then we have to kind of step back for a brief moment and have a discussion on what is industrialized construction. Um, you know, and here's two images which I think kind of uh, capture the essence of maybe what I think about when I when I think about industrialized construction. So you have kind of the volumetric modular, you have advanced robotics with with spatially framed um, timber assemblies, uh, and um, so this is kind of a high level. But I also want to address the fact that uh, we firmly uh, believe and talk about the idea that um, digitalization is not the same as industrialization. So um, I want to just address the kind of BIM conversation, which I have a lot. Um, you know, uh, the idea of BIM was that we wanted to create our, our, our building information model and we wanted to create our, our, our digital models of the, of the product. Um, and it has done a long way in advancing our kind of fundamental understanding of, of data and how we deal with data in the construction industry. But it's a mistake to think that digitalization is the same as industrialization. And it's a second mistake to think that digitalization naturally will lead to industrialization or the same skills that you require for digitalization or the same skills you need for industrialization. These two are different concepts. We should treat them differently and we should think about them differently. Um, I think of digitalization as kind of a subset of the skills that are needed for industrialization. 
Um, this whole conversation has been referred to as this construction 4.0. It's a bit of a buzzword. I don't know if I like to include it. It, it builds on this industry 4.0. Um, but this is this idea of a new vision for the construction industry, um, which, which is in consideration of this industry 4.0 movement. Um, and these are some of the research areas within our group and, and with how I think about the industrialization of construction. So we talk about advanced IT tools, BIM or, or otherwise. We talk about automation, prefabrication, um, the linkage between cyber and physical systems. Maybe it's referred to as digital twins. Supply and logistics, a topic that almost never gets talked about at conferences, but it's almost essential. Um, product platforms, uh, blockchain, and, uh, and also new customer and market focus. And today specifically, I just want to touch on our view of product platforms, because I think that might be one of the most relevant for the mass timber um, industry. And that's what I would love to have a conversation moving forward about as, as we have many mass timber uh, people who are interested in mass timber or, or experts in mass timber. So um, that that would be, uh, this is where we'll, we'll, we'll start now. And um, the higher level uh, point that I would like to make about product platforms, and I'll explain what they are, is that I believe with what I see in industrialized construction, we are moving from a project paradigm to a product platform paradigm. So we need to first identify and set out what is a product platform? And so we start with what is a platform? And a platform is basically a set of components that are common, their modules or parts that form a common structure and which a stream of derivative products can be effectively developed and produced. That's the technical academic definition. Um, the easier definition is it's Legos. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an idea that you create a certain um, a kit or, 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 or a product architecture that adheres to specific rules. And those pieces can be configured and put together in different ways, but they follow an established pattern. And so it allows you to, to build multiple products from the same technical framework. And the way that looks like is illustrated here. So you might have your, your product platform, your Legos, which the product platform is the rules that govern the design of the pieces. Right, so I like to call, I, I, I play a lot with Legos when I was a kid and my kids play with Legos too. Um, the idea that I call it like the kind of one dot rule. So it's kind of like everything is on this one dot grid and they're spaced equally apart and you, you know that the pieces will lock together. Um, but then when you order a new Lego kit, you get your, your kit, your project kit. So they, from that platform, they derive a specific kit for your project and then they, you can build many different projects from, the, from that kit. Right. So this is how we can start to think about um, uh, the idea that we should develop product platforms and not projects. Right now, um, if you would ask, where do we invest time, money, energy in design? It all goes towards projects and all the continuity that and all the, the lessons that we learn from our projects gets lost when that project is done. We call that actually a learning disability in the industry. So the project teams come together. They work really hard for two or three years. All of this knowledge is generated and then the team breaks apart and you may never work with those same people again. You definitely won't work with the exact same people again. You might work with a few of them, but there's a lot of tacit knowledge and work routine that's embedded in this process that's lost when the project ends. So instead we argue that um, you can put this knowledge into a product platform and start to begin to release versions of a product platform in which um, projects should flow from. This very much aligns with the idea of like an iPhone where you know you have version one and version two and version three and therefore each version gets a little bit better so all of your lessons learned recycles back into the product platform. Um, the other key point is how do we transfer information and how do we embed information um, and this would be this typical process of a um, of an industrialized uh, product line and you would start with design and customer acquisition, and then you would have some kind of configuration engineering. Then you would have manufacturing and production, and finally assembly and logistics. And we're very used to this process on the bottom, if you've been around the architecture, engineering, construction world, where information is gonna transfer downstream. So it's gonna start to move, uh, you know, you start with your Revit model, you start putting in some more information, and you know, you go to engineering and you know, all the way towards the end, right? So you start transferring the information down the stream. But what we're really terrible at in AEC is transferring rules and restraints upstream. So understanding the constraints of assembly and logistics, understanding the specific 
types of manufacturing capabilities of your supply chain, understanding how the engineering can be configured in the most cost-effective way, and embedding those into an early stage design tool so that designers can, uh, can make sure that the designs that they make don't break the rules of the downstream supply chain. And now you're talking about, uh, and I've seen other, other presentations, like uh, I saw the design to production we speaking, it's this design to production supply chain. Um, otherwise, you're stuck in this process where you have design intent, and then you have to try to meet the design intent, and uh, you have no continuity between the, the supply chain. Um, so this is really the idea of embedding these rules earlier in the design stage. And let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, we, we start to get into this area of, uh, of design configurators that are fabrication aware and use kit of parts. And I was first introduced to this idea in uh, you know, kind of discussions and collaboration with a company called Project Frog. And then I'm gonna explain kind of where we've gone with our, our latest work. So um, a couple of years ago, uh, Project Frog came out with something they called My Project Frog. And it was their, um, you know, uh, they had their kit of parts here and then they had a, a product design behind it where they would, would, they would embed the rules of the kit of parts into um, an automation engine that would help them design and then you know, be able to spit out manufacturing and construction. And this is a video, if you if you see me speak for a while, I show this video a lot because it's just a, such a good, simple example. This is a school system. They're adding in all of the rules on a four foot grid, adding in the windows and doors. It's lightweight, it's browser based. Um, you're just basically conf configuring the building with the custom components that you want. You need to add shear walls because there needs to be some structural um, capabilities. And then because you have the rules embedded on the back end, you can run a design status and say, okay, this design works. And from here, you can generate then the bill of materials, the component model, the shop drawings, all the permanent construction drawings and calculations, because you've thought about the rules behind it. And to me, this shifts us away from the dominant paradigm of BIM as the input. So we start with a blank space and we just start drawing in Revit and start adding and adding and adding information and in quite heavy and um, high definition models by the end. And it changes the, the focus to BIM as an output. So the configuration happens in a more lightweight browser-based user experience and interface. And then the output of this is the LOD 400 component model. Um, so this is the, uh, the opportunity I think we have towards fabrication aware design configurators. Part of this was inspiration for our, our future vision of industrialized construction, which we're calling the seven day house fabrication aware generative design. And this was a recent project funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation. We're just getting started. So I don't have a lot of results to share with you, but I do have this conceptual orientation of how we're thinking about a future vision for industrialized construction. And it may be interesting also for the mass timber community to think about. Um, I drew a lot of inspiration from something called the three-day car research program, where it was clear that um, if you wanted to, uh, this was a research program in the 2000s, where basically European automakers were getting crushed by uh, Toyota and by other competitors, and were not able to, to deliver um, their cars at a lot of uh, uh, inventory. And they said, what if we did a mass customized uh, order, a uh, uh, made to order so that you could order, a customer could order a car and within three days they could have a car delivered to them. Um, and so as one of their first activities, they actually traced the supply chain and they said, okay, well, let's look on average how long it takes for our customers who order a customized vehicle to receive it. And they started taking a look at it and they looked at the production time, the time actually that the car was on the assembly line in the factory. And uh, they found out that it was only a day and a half of production time. So then the three-day car should be quite uh, easy to realize. You know, there's only a few other things you have to do. Um, and there was some time about leaving the factory and distributing it to the end customer that took a few days. But really where all the time came was at the, the input, the order, the scheduling, and the sequencing on the construction line. Altogether, this was 34 days. And I think this quote uh, really highlighted the, the, the challenges that processing the order from the customer to the assembly line was the single greatest bottleneck in the whole supply chain. Um, this is a problem of taking customers' wishes and intents and delivering it into a fabrication system. 
And I think it's a very, well, while the car industry and the construction industry are different, I don't like to pretend that these are the same. I do think that this kind of uh, challenge is one that we face also, is how do we process an order uh, from a customer into a fabrication line for industrialization? I think it's a very relevant challenge. And so we set ourselves forward with this challenge. We said, can we generate a fully customized home design um, in one day while maintaining supply chain continuity and fabrication for fabrication delivery in the next six days? And we called this the seven day house. So um, our, we thought, okay, if we're gonna build a house in seven days, we only get one day for design. We're gonna need at least six days for uh, fabrication and delivery. Um, and we really see that this is kind of in between the traditional design process, which is very bespoke and not really optimized. And on the other side, you also have this mass production paradigm, which I think we all don't want. We've seen the failures of mass production of housing before, where you have very efficient industrialized um, blocks of buildings, but there's really no customization uh, and the architecture is terrible. And in the 60s and 70s, we suffered from a, a poor quality as well, where we got a bad reputation. Um, then if you look at traditional design process, you have these generative design tools. Um, they tend to be uh, very good at optimizing um, for spatial or energy requirements. But uh, my critique of most generative design tools is that they have no real meaningful connection to supply chain. I would say that they have no fabrication awareness. And on the other side, um, we're starting to see, like I show with, with what the example from Project Frog, we're seeing examples for mass customization. Um, and these are really nice tools, but they tend to be more manually configured. So you can only explore one or two options. Um, and furthermore, they, they tend to be more on a, a grid structure because of the rules of how we need to configure it. So what we're trying to do is now create some continuity and we're starting with an adaptive kit of parts. So we wanna include supplier elements and understand and model kind of the subsystem library of the components we're gonna choose from. Now, we have to be very specific about the components we select because we need to know the specific information. So this is not kind of a design intense supplier element. It needs to be specific pieces in the supply chain that are picked out. Um, then we need to think about the structural models and, and kind of the ways that um, the, the system library can categorize the spaces and then also the spatial layouts and the overall architecture. Furthermore, we think that this one day customer journey is gonna look a little bit different. So we're exploring how a customer can visualize and understand their space uh, you know, in one day using virtual reality and also um, how they should interact with such a generative model using interactive genetic algorithm. And drawing from the experience we have at ETH about fabrication um, for robotics, we, we understand fabrication informed modeling and now we have to expand it to a more robust um, way of thinking about uh, spatial layouts. And the way that we will, we are gonna operationalize this is with a, a top-up unit, um, which kind of goes on top of an existing building, just as a, a small way of realizing a project in, in seven days. So I'd be happy to discuss kind of our vision for a seven day house, but we view this as a challenge. I don't know if we'll meet it, but we're using it as a challenge to spur a new way of thinking, a new way of, um, uh, a new way of optimizing our systems with consideration of supply chain and not just um, thinking about design or structure, but also thinking about what can the supply chain deliver. And this kind of rethinking from the seven day house leads to this, the second part of the presentation I wanna talk about, which is about new business models in construction. And to me, this has been uh, really drawing from my experience with the industrialized construction forum. Um, we're seeing that a lot of companies are approaching industrialized construction with an entirely new business model. And in other words, the old kind of uh, design bid build or, or low bid tender process, it doesn't work for industrialization of construction. There's too much uh, knowledge that needs to be required from the supply chain to pretend that you can get that information in a low bid tender process. Um, and I'd like to point out that this idea of, of um, new business models um, is, is, is an important one because when we start talking about disruption of an industry, and I, I think it's a word that gets thrown around maybe too much, but I'll use it anyways. Um, when you think about the, the example of the iPhone, um, the iPhone came out in 2007, 2008, I can't remember the exact year right now. Um, and Steve Jobs infamously said, uh, we won't have like an app store. Everything is, every, all of the internet applications can be found through our Safari browser. 
Um, and this was not met with a lot of uh, love from the development community. Um, and it was actually not until about six months later when Apple changed course and released the App Store um, that we really saw the rise of the iPhone uh, that, that, uh, that we know today. And this is the idea of taking a new technology or a new hardware um, and coupling it with a new business model, a digital platform. And so I would argue that for the industrialization of construction, we have new technologies and what companies are searching for right now are new business models. Um, and it's quite clear that a lot of companies are searching for these things. Um, here are just a few examples of the headlines of the investments to disrupt construction. And uh, you know, this has been my experience as well, where we've seen a huge amount of money being poured into the industrialization of construction. Of course, the construction market is, is very large, so these companies see the opportunity. Um, we all, I think, are familiar, and I think, Greg, one of your speakers maybe is also Katera. So um, they were the ones that got the most amount of money. And, you know, I got to visit their factory right before COVID also in, in January of, of 2020 to see what they're working on. This is their factory in Tracy. Um, but I, I also would say that we shouldn't think that it's just Katera. And we're seeing that there's just, uh, this is a white paper that we wrote. There's a huge amount of, of, of venture capital being poured into industrialization of construction. And coming back to the business models, the, the kind of traditional way of thinking about innovation was with project innovation. Um, again, you kind of pour all your knowledge into the project, but you run into the same problem where the, the knowledge is not captured or structured in a way that it can be reused. So what we're seeing is two new types of um, business models to take advantage of um, the development of these product platforms. The first, the first one which Katera uses, which many others are using right now, is a strategy towards vertical integration. So everything in-house, um, put everything together. And this really gives you a chance to go quickly. You don't have to worry about other partners. You don't have to bring other people along. Um, so it's quite effective, but it has a big risk because you have to put a lot of high capital expenditures into it. Um, and the other one is the example I showed with Project Frog. And we're seeing a lot of other examples here of digital systems integration. And these are the Kind of industrialized construction companies that are not starting their own factories but they're coordinating the system they're putting together a new network of suppliers and they're creating a product architecture without owning the means of production themselves and project frog has this frog kit they 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 don't manufacture anything themselves but they coordinate the design so these are the two types of of new business models that we see emerging um and you know, we did a comparison paper. We saw there was advantages and disadvantages to all of them. So I don't, I don't pick a winner or a loser. I think they all have have um, appropriate benefits and risks. Um, the project innovation is less change to the existing business, um, but the negative is you have to re-educate the supply chain every time. Vertical gives you that full stack integration and a lot of speed to capture the market right now, but it's also very risky because of the capital intensity. And the digital systems is more a capital lights, kind of industry 4.0, agile product development approach, but there's less control over the product um, because you're working with a network of suppliers. And so you have to engage in a bit of a, a co-creation process, which can take longer. Um, and finally, as I, as I thought a little bit about this connection to um, mass timber, I came back to this older view of a business model for industrialized construction from some of my Swedish colleagues who, who have put a lot of work um, in the, on the academic side, as well as many good examples of companies. And here you could think about what is the business model in perspective of the product offering, the market position, and the operational platform. And I think for those of you here today, you're quite clear on your product offering. You would like to do something or you're interested in mass timber as a product offering. And I hope what my talk today did was challenge you to think also about these other two areas because they're equally important. What is your operational platform and what is your market position? And do you challenge the existing uh, uh, status quo of how we deliver projects? Did you just go on a project by project play basis or are you thinking about product platforms? And here's a set of questions that you can ask to help further you're thinking about the business model of industrialized uh, construction for mass timber. So on the product side, it's, I think it's quite clear. What do we offer? Who's the customer? What's the price level? I mean, these are things that we're very used to thinking about. Um, but then on the 
on the operational platform, it's more about our production strategy. So how prefabricated is the is the approach for mass timber? Um, you know, are we going to own our own production or buy from suppliers? Have we developed the product platform? And do we do we predefine the platform? I wasn't able to talk about predefinition, but that's a whole nother topic. Um, and then market position. So what is our role in the supply chain? Who do we sell to? Um, do we have long-term partnerships in our supply chain or do we still coordinate on a project by project basis? Are we thinking about logistics and continuity? These are all the opportunities that I think we need to, to think about if we're gonna make mass timber successful. All right, so now I just have one more little short bit at the end, which you'll have to humor me because I am a professor and I do think about teaching also. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's about teaching the next generation of students. So if we believe that industrialized construction or, or mass timber has the potential for disruption, um, then the question that I like to ask is, how should we prepare the next generation of AEC to think disruptively? And so I, I use a couple of examples from my class um, where we're trying to teach the next generation of students through ideas of entrepreneurship. So we bring in speakers who are leading uh, thinkers in terms of entrepreneurship about new ideas. We actually asked the class to come up with their own new company idea, their new startup. Uh, we bring them to factories. Here's Erne uh, Holzbau, which is a, a leading um, uh, timber fabricator here in, in Switzerland. Um, so they can actually see the production site, understand what a factory looks like. Um, and the reason we need this is uh, in, in, in some of my work, you know, I talked with, uh, I had an interview with, with someone I won't say who, and they, they quoted, they said, um, we're looking for an experienced senior manager with a hybrid background between an industrial engineer and a construction engineer. And then he kind of laughed and said, that person doesn't exist. Like as someone with 10 years experience with industrial engineering and construction management, it just doesn't exist. We're not training, uh, we haven't trained and we haven't had enough people around for a long time. Um, to, to fill these new roles and these new needs that the, that the uh, new kind of industrialized industry requires. So I think that as educators, it's our responsibility to start training these, these students to do that. And so here's an example from uh, my class. This was the team of uh, multidisciplinary students coming together. Um, they have new, new titles. So I don't let them call themselves architects, engineers, construction managers. There's the director of product development or technical systems or strategy and market. So we get outside of this existing paradigm and we start thinking about the new product value that we put together. And then the teams put together new configurators or new kits of parts and they have to think about um, what, their, what their company will offer on the market and, and how they would execute it. All right, so that's been 30, 31 minutes about industrialized construction and mass timber. Um, maybe I'd make some high level summaries here. Uh, BIM is not industrialized construction. Digitalization is not industrialization. It's only the starting point. Um, I really believe that there's an opportunity to develop product platforms and fabrication aware design configurators. Uh, globally, we're seeing huge investments in this area of construction 4.0. And um, it's not business as usual. There's actually new business models to capture value. And I personally think that we have a, a need and a responsibility to teach this next generation of innovators um, so that they're ready for the industrialized construction future that I believe is, is coming. Um, so with that, uh, very happy for your questions, comments. Here's our research group. You can find our group page. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. Actually, there's a typo in my, in my Twitter profile. There's no underscore here. But uh, uh, overall, um, you know, very uh, happy to be here and uh, happy for the discussion that we can have now. So thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. I, I want to ask the first question, if I may. I mean, you, you started the Industrialized Construction Forum. You worked at Stanford. You're in Silicon Valley for years with an international uh, network. And now you're at ETH in Zurich. And so now you're at another epicenter of innovation. Can you talk a bit about the differences and alignments you're seeing? Absolutely. And I'm just trying to figure out why Zoom is hiding from me so I can stop sharing my screen. But I'll figure that out later. Um, Oh, there it is. It's because I have. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, the differences. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, my, my first thought is um, in in Silicon Valley, people promise less with or promise more with less. And here in uh, in Switzerland, people suggest less with much more. And uh, it's just a difference of cultures. Um, and I don't argue that one is better than the other. But in at Stanford. 
um, people were looking for big ideas and would then kind of backfill. They were quite smart, but would backfill with some of the technical competencies or, or figure that out. Uh, and I would say in Switzerland, we have extremely high technical competencies, but a lack of thinking about the scalability and how this could you know, uh, move into the market. Um, so there is a lot of innovation, but it's not necessarily making its way into the industry. Um, as quickly as I think it could. So my challenge that I try to bring to Switzerland is how do we how do we bring this out and, and show what great work is is going on here. So thanks. So uh, do you want uh, the questions are coming in the QA. Do you want to read them or do you want me to have them read them out to you? How about you read them just so my voice gets a break because I was also <laughs> lecturing earlier today, so I'm a bit tired. <laughs> sure, of course. Um, here's one. What is the status of integrating sustainable construction practices and materials in industrialized construction platforms? For example, carbon analysis, renewable materials, clay, straw, hemp, deconstruction, recyclability. That's such a good question. Um, <clears throat> and one that I get a lot. I didn't talk about our research line about resource efficiency or circularity for industrialized construction. Um, let's, let's just jump right to circularity. Um, I mean, if you know about circular economy, it's the idea that we move away from a linear economy where we take, make, and dispose of materials and we try to create more circular supply chain loops. Um, and uh, if, you, if you see what circular economy requires, it requires very good knowledge of supply chain and very good, um, uh, and a new business model, right? Because you want to kind of understand and reclaim things like renting carpet as a service so that the carpet manufacturer can return it and, and reuse it or having a building that can be designed for disassembly. And the argument that I make there is that um, if you don't understand supply chain, you'll never achieve kind of circularity. And industrialized construction is the best knowledge of supply chain we have for the construction industry. So I think right away, um, it creates a lot of opportunities. Um, Furthermore, uh, you know, if if you're going to talk about um, if you're going to talk about you know new materials, we could talk about more bio-based materials. Um, you know, one of the key questions is is you know if you have a new material, how does it perform in an in situ on-site kind of uh, application, right? So by going to a more industrialized supply chain, I think we have the opportunity for more guarantee of material of higher quality materials. In, and uh, more industrialized processes so that we can ensure that these better bio-based solutions come into play. Um, all right, I'm answering quite long, but my final point would be industrialized construction offers the opportunity for dematerialization. We see at ETH, we have a, one example of what we call a smart slab, where we 3D print the formwork. Um, if you think about the reason why a structural slab is rectangular, it's not because of its structural characteristics, it's because um, it's very easy for a concrete to be poured in a rectangle with the formwork, uh, but we can 3D print the formwork and by doing so, um, provide the same structural strength while reducing materials by up to 70% uh, has been claimed by some of my colleagues. So um, by industrializing the process, we really have a good chance for, um, for uh, more material efficiency and dematerialization in the built environment. All right, long answer. I won't answer that long for all of them. But very good question. Lech <laughs> uh, Mazinski asked, uh, what do the architects think of the concept of Project Frog? I think that's a question to you and the architects. Yeah, I think they don't like it. I mean, <laughs> so, but, I mean the, it's, a, it's a starting point. I mean, look, uh, not every building needs to be complete fle completely flexible. And I think, um, but I think we also have to be realistic that uh, designing on a grid is not going to work for our you know, societal expectations about architecture. And so it's a starting point where we can, we can start to move um, towards more standardized and mass customized solutions, but we do need to find ways to bring in more design flexibility. And um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's where we need to go. Well, further to that, a question I would ask, what's the reception you're receiving for your seven day house project? I mean, when you're looking, talking about with architects versus manufacturers or builders, yeah, I think there's interest because, um, well, um, I, I think that uh, there's been a lot of interest. Let's say, let's say that there's been a lot of interest. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a, a feeling that the generative design conversation, and I don't want to be too critical of it because it's important, but needs a kind of boost forward um, because we've been talking about general generative design for a while, and uh, you know, it's 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 quite interesting. 
but we're not really connecting it to the, to the further steps in the supply chain. That's kind of what I already said. Um, and I would say from the architecture standpoint, um, there is an, an interest in thinking about these fabric. I mean, look, if, if we're gonna, we're trying to go away from, from kind of box or mass customization, we're trying to incorporate some, you know, angular cuts and, you know, the machine's not gonna care if, the, if it's a 90 degree or a 47.5 uh, degree angle. So we now have some flexibility if we can inform the fabrication model correctly, uh, but it's a big task. So um, yeah, uh, I feel like people are intrigued, but we haven't delivered anything yet. So uh, I think it's kind of a, 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 you know, still waiting to see what we can show. Right. Um, here's another question, for, this one from Frank Weeks. Starting with what we have right now in the AEC industry, who do you see being the best lead driver in construction 4.0? Architects, builders, owners, developers, government agencies? Ooh, uh, none of the above. <laughs> A startup that has all of those things in one. Um, yeah, because um, I mean, I was actually just I was just teaching my course, and we 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 talk about um, the Japanese house building industry, which has had a forty or 50 year long industrialization of housing. It's very well established, unlike some other places. And what's interesting was I was reading this and, you know, when, when, this, when the Japanese industry really industrialized in the 60s and 70s, um, they said that none of the existing companies came from craft industry, from kind of like, uh, you know, on-site uh, builders or architects. They were all startups, I guess they called them, you know, new conglomerates, uh, but so, Basically, no existing company was able to evolve. It came from startups. Now, I don't want to be too start startup biased, and, and some of my work talks about how existing companies can can transition or should think about transitioning to, to move, as we say, from from brokers to builders. Um, and uh, yeah, but I mean, I, one thing that I've found in my work is that we have to break out of these distinct roles because um, we need to find ways to get people together. But yeah, so I would say all all of them all that knowledge together would be would be like the superstar team. And the next question is from Alexander Stephenson. This is a very interesting subject. As a current student, I always find myself asking the question, but how do I integrate this into my learning and try to bring it to the industry? So the question full is, how do you see we bring forth the technology to a point where it is available for everyone to both play around with as well as prove that it is a viable way of business? Um, uh, oh, good question, Alexander. Um, how do we bring it forth to a point where it's available for everyone to play around with? I mean, one thing I do think is that we will see design tools more democratized and maybe more simplified. Um, so uh, this would be a nice starting point. Um, but uh, no, I don't, I don't know if we're gonna, I mean, you have efforts like WikiHouse or, or kind of open source communities that are trying to be this kind of open source maker and design space. Um, but I don't know if we're gonna get to the point where it's available for everyone to play around with. Um, I would argue most right now, I, I don't know if, if, if all technology we have in AAC is also available. So I, I don't know, I don't have a good answer. I don't know, Greg, what do you think? <laughs> I don't have an answer for that too. I mean, I, I hope that day comes and the market certainly wants that, uh, but who will develop it? Because a lot of uh, existing players would find it against their existing business model. Yeah, so. exactly. I mean, that's like, I, I, I love the idea of everything being open source, but also in the end, these companies are trying to make profits and uh, they're gonna be looking for ways to do that, so. Here's a, I'll give you another question. This one from Mark Devereaux. This is fascinating. Have you seen any formal digitized versions of a supply chain ecosystem, as opposed to a vertically integrated organization like Katera. Uh, yeah, you should take a look at um, what uh, Splash Modular and their Revia platform is trying to do. Um, and uh, Katera was also trying to develop their own um, supply chain ecosystem. They called it the Apollo platform. It didn't come through. Uh, they ended up canceling it. But um, so they were also trying it. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of other kinds of supply chain ecosystems. Um, I feel like there's one more that's just 
slipping my mind. But yes, we are seeing people talking about this. And um, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think that it, we, we kind of call it the orchestrator model, right? So instead of the builder, you're the orchestrator, you're kind of organizing everything into a, into a, a platform. Um, yeah. Here's a the question from Stefan Schneider, my business partner. Um, do you see the solution in completely new software solutions? Or do you see an adoption of existing market proven solutions? The same with hardware, CNC and robots. Ooh, good question. Um, I see the need for software solutions that integrate. Um, I mean, I just mentioned like uh, like Revia platform or or like you know what Project Frog was was trying to do, which is which is create a kind of a configurator. So I see a lot of companies also developing their own configurators right now, and I would argue that's an it's a new software solution, but it's also not like it's completely new. They have the knowledge and they're just creating a a, a user friendly tool to make it more simple to design with. Um, so. Uh, do I see an adoption of existing market proven solutions? If that means kind of like the, the adoption of things like Autodesk um, or other, other BIM tools, um, could be. Uh, I think in, Autodesk is putting a lot of effort into their industrialized construction team recently. Um, you know, for me, the, from the, I'll start with the software side. It's all about, are you linking fabrication to design? To me, if, if, you, if you link fabrication upstream to design and you create flexibility, um, then you have a really good and novel solution. So whoever comes up with that, uh, I think is, is ahead of the game. Um, on the hardware side, uh, what we're trying to do on the research side is, is model the, the constraints of the CNC into the design models so that um, we can use the existing CNC. And um, on the other side, what my colleagues do who are the roboticists and the visionary architects, are developing new functionalities for in situ and offsite robotics. So I think, in that sense, it's not so much about the robotics, but it's about the about the tooling. It's about the path planning, and um, you know, I think in those cases, you might see some things be commercialized, um, or you might see kind of a suite of flexible robotic fabrication tools. Um, so I, I, I don't know if Steph and I answer your, your, your question perfectly, but that's kind of how I see the space. Thank you. Um, here's a question from Thomas da Silva Vieira. Using a platform design, I believe you have to have a construction system behind the scenes that follows certain rules. Could you talk more about that? Yeah, exactly. You do. And this is not something we like if you come from AEC. So, um, Let's just let's just have an honest conversation around it. I mean, if you tell, uh, I'll use an example from Skanska. I won't pick on on architects, but I think it's a similar a similar challenge. I mean, Skanska used to have a slogan that said, "We build everything for everyone," and that's a very good model if you're a general contractor, and it's a very bad model if you're an industrialized construction company. And I've seen construction industrialized construction companies really struggle, um, even some current companies now, with having too open of a, of a product focus and saying that we can customize our, our, our production line for whatever the needs are. Really the, the smart way is figuring out this kind of decoupling between what are the things that you're gonna standardize and then where is your design flexibility going to be? Um, and what happens is that you need to have very clear strategic market focus and customer understanding. And this is different than what we're used to where we go on a project by project basis, because now we're talking about investing in technologies. So especially these vertically integrated companies, I think of Bocluc, which is a Scan Scandinavian company, um, uh, joint venture between Skanska and Ikea. Um, you know, and my, my good friend and colleague, Jörg Lessing, I don't know if he's speaking for this, but uh, you know, he's, uh, he's, um, he's been working for a long time. You know, they have a customer in mind. It's a single mother who has a job as a nurse. And they are trying to build a house that's affordable for her. And I think it was like their mandate at the start that if we cannot achieve this, then we're shutting down the company or, or so the story goes. And so um, having this customer in mind, it's, it's, it's very much a product development idea. You, you think of your end customer, you think of their price points, and you design a product to meet that target cost. Um, this is very different than our approach now. And so I would say 
um, yeah, we, you have to have a, a construction system. It follows some certain rules and you have to be very clear if, uh, but when, before you invest, if you're gonna be vertically integrated, before you invest in the technologies, if, if this is the right investment for your, your customer profile. So I don't know if that's exactly, Thomas, what you were going for, but that's kind of one point I wanted to make, so. Thank you. A um, couple more questions. This one from Michael Vanderplug. Do you think innovation in Japan was spurred by the depreciation of their housing assets versus the appreciation in Western economies? I, I can't say that I know enough about the Japanese um, uh, uh, markets and, and, and how they came up with this industrialized solution. So um, I, won't, I won't say that, I, I can't speculate. So, yeah, okay. I don't know the answer. And uh, here's a question from Stefan Pikler. Sorry about the pronunciation. Uh, what would it take to support existing companies, especially SMEs, to move towards industrialized construction? Oh, good, good question. Um, I mean, I, I get a question similar to this also, which is, you know, are we going to head towards a, a world where Google and uh, Facebook own construction or we have like really big single companies and um, that are like, global industrialized construction companies? And my answer is typically no, I don't think we'll go there, but I do think we are facing some consolidation in the industry. And so um, I think SMEs should be smart about how they plan forward with industrialized construction. Um, now, one option is if you get kind of a networked ecosystem, you can join and be a part of that. Um, I've, I've seen a couple of examples of SMEs try to join such a, such a kind of coordinated supply chain. And I think this is a good strategy, but you also have to remember that there are some negatives of such a, um, such a platform. Um, we, we can see examples from, um, from Uber or from um, other platform organizations where you, you tend to get central players, it starts to take a big chunk of the, of the profits, right? So SMEs should also be wary of such a network where, or platform where someone kind of promises to use their product uh, on demand, and then they have to give up a bit more of their of their profits and their revenue margins. So um, now I'm getting all around the question. So what what would it take for uh, to support these existing companies? If you look in the UK, they're putting a lot of government funding into into supporting SMEs to transition. That's not really a model that works in Switzerland or the US. Um, I do think it is about um, uh, making smart investments. Um, and, and thinking about how, how will you connect to a larger ecosystem? So how can your products be found digitally? Um, how can you uh, partner in the long-term? Well, maybe that's my answer is that we're seeing long-term partnerships and how can SMEs create partnerships with other builders um, so that you have more longer-term partnerships? I'll stick with that. <laughs> Good. Well, here, here's a question I have. Um, I'm fascinated by your seven day house project, especially as it applies to mass timber. Um, and part of what, I'm, the reason I organized this event is to connect innovators like you and then share information because it's not, doesn't travel quickly enough across borders. There's a lot of reinventing the wheel, I think in construction. How do you, rather than organize a mass timber design competition only, how would you, or how should I, with you and others organize a product <laughs> platform design competition. I was just gonna say, yeah, make it a product platform design competition. Yeah, I mean, ask, ask people to design a minimum viable product instead of a full building. And I think you'll see a very different approach to design um, because a minimum viable product should stand alone and then it should have increased functionality as the company matures or as the product platform matures and you start to create options. Um, but right now we design buildings with all the bells and whistles and everything. No, I mean, look, I'm being a bit uh, over-exaggerative, but we, we, we try to really kind of put everything we can into the single project because it's our one shot, right? And maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, maybe it costs a bit more, but we want to put our stamp on that, right? Uh, we want to be able to say we, we, we designed that, that great building. And I totally get that. Um, but if you were asking people to design a product platform, it would be a very different, it would be kind of questions about scalability, customer value, cost effectiveness, um, you know, repeatability of processes. And those are very different conversations than a single building design. So that would be, I mean, I would say that that would be a very unique competition if you ran such a product platform competition. 
I actually, that actually is the intention. Uh, if I don't make the scope too big, but even within this existing network, I think it would be really helpful to have a competition where they're designing for manufacturing towards that product platform direction. And even, even map, but what even about mapping out existing product platform that exist that you're seeing within Switzerland and Germany and Austria, I generally, there's probably not a lot of aware of those awareness of those in the US market. Yeah, I mean, what I would say is the US market, I mean, the product, the mass timber product platforms, the big ones I think about are Kateras and uh, Sidewalk, um, or their, their new factory co spinoff. And, um, you know, then there's some really interesting space like Intelligent City or um, some others that are really kind of fo focusing on, the, on their product platform. And um, I would say that actually in Switzerland, what I see is some very good fabrication capabilities, but also not such a strong understanding of, of the product platform and how it moves forward. So I see, I see much higher fabrication competencies here. I also see some product development, which is really good. So like, um, uh, well, like the Cree, um, uh, the Cree system is, it would be an example of a, of a product platform from Romberg in, uh, in, Bregenz Austria. Also, Erne, the company I, I mentioned earlier, they've created kind of this, this product they call like a Superfloor EcoBoost, which is a mix of concrete and timber, lightweight concrete with also integrated HVAC systems. Um, so they're doing very nice product design, uh, but I don't know if it's the same like mindset of a product platform, which is going to kind of uh, emerge uh, version one, version two, version three. Um, I actually don't know for sure because I haven't had those conversations. The product platform mindset is the strongest in Sweden, I would say, where they really are, are thinking about their product platform and uh, uh, being very intentional about when they go to the next version, they, it's like a big deal, right? It's like, okay, we've we spent two years from projects. We've learned everything we can. We're now releasing our next version of the product platform. And, uh, you know, to me, that's a very structured way of thinking about product platforms. So. If we have anyone to learn from, it would be the, the Swedes. I, I think what Switzerland offers is really this really great knowledge about fabrication um, and uh, the industry is, is really well developed there compared to elsewhere. So Perfect, thanks for that answer. And I will follow up with you to, to kind of advise us or the group <laughs> about how to put together exactly that kind of competition. Because Let's I do, think do it, there, that would be fun. <laughs> there would be fun. Well, perfect, I, I, and then we do have, um, uh, Sidewalk Labs speaking here. Uh, Katera was going to, but they didn't come back, but I'll have them give further presentations moving forward. But I, yeah, I think this would be fascinating. There's a big business opportunity there, but we need the advice of people like you who are looking at those platforms emerging all over Europe and uh, other countries. Absolutely. Oh, beautiful. I think we've taken all the questions. Um, you've shared your contact information and uh, I know you've got to move off to the next class, but I just thought, uh, if people want to get a hold of you, they can contact you there. And I hope you can engage with the community here going forward. And also we're at a future event in Switzerland. Do we have a tentative event planned in January at ETH in January yes. of 2022? Are you also going to organize an, another industrialized construction forum? This is the plan. I mean, we we were hoping to organize the first industrialized construction forum in Europe based in Zurich. Uh, the goal was in, uh, what was it, uh, spring or no, it was first going to be in, in, in autumn, right? And then COVID, COVID came and then we had spring and now it's kind of indefinitely on hold. But um, with, with your ideas of, of coming in, in January, um, we'd love to do it. Uh, we'd love to bring kind of this industrialized construction format to, to Europe and, to, and host it in Zurich. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's keep that conversation going. And uh, people can feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. I'm very active there. Um, you can also feel free to LinkedIn or, or email. Um, and uh, yeah, happy to keep the conversation going and um, we'll go from there. <laughs> well, thank you for your time. You've given us a good hour and uh, I'll be in touch. And thanks so much. It's extremely informative as always. Thanks a lot, Greg. And I hope that the uh, Mass Timber March Madness goes well. And it seems the speaker lineup is fantastic. Great job organizing. And uh, thanks everyone for sticking around and listening. So thank you all.